Well, folks, welcome back to the Hog Pod. And as always, thanks for checking in. When we decide to buy a Harley Davidson, we very quickly find out that we have entered a whole new way of life, instantly making connections with thousands of people right across the UK and Ireland. Owning a Harley is a real leveller, regardless of our home situations, our positions in work, and everything that has got us to that point in life. Straddling a Harley Davidson simply levels it all. And today we're joined by a man that has expanded that idea into what is now nothing short of a movement within the UK. Every year, thousands of veterans gather together in remembrance of all the sacrifices made by men and women over the last seven decades. What started out as a small ride out some years ago has turned into a national event where thousands upon thousands of bikers of all brands and models make their annual pilgrimage to the wall. The strength of the connection among these people known as wallers is very plain to see and it's a fitting tribute to the many names etched into the stone but here to tell us about it today is the right of the wall founder martin dickinson martin how you doing fine thank you cheers guys how you doing martin very very happy to have you on the show today um could we start off martin just tell us a little bit about yourself right uh 63 years old, got into Harleys in 2002. Prior to that, I served in the military from 78 to 83. And then in 85, spent 30 years in the prison service. Uh, so that's uh, that's a brief of me outside of Harley. Uh, 2002, I joined, I bought my first Harley and joined our local chapter, which was Neem Valley. Uh, I was assistant director in 2003 became director in 2004 and then had three stints of director total in 14 and a half years. A lot of experience there within the role of Harley Davidson. How, how long have you actually been part of the national team? I was, I was on the national team from 2007 to 2010 with Marge and then I lost my wife in 2009. So in 2010, I stood down and then came back on in 2020. So 10-year 10 10 year gap. And what brought you back? Were you, did you get a tap on the shoulder or did you go make inquiries to see if you could um, sort of get back involved again? No, I, uh, I think at the time Gordon was doing rock and Marge, I think Marge spoke to Gordon and Gordon spoke to me uh, because I, obviously from 2007 to 10, I'd worked with Marge on... I think we used to call it heat then, or there was different names. It was uh, it was primary officer tra- pot and heat and hot. Uh, yeah, so uh, it was around the time when we started looking at doing the Unity ride, and then they just asked. I just got asked if I'd come back on the national team, which uh, I was more than happy to do. Obviously, as I said in the introduction, um, you are the founder of Ride to the Wall. I think most of us would have to have been living under a rock if we had to have never have seen the uh, your logo or the, the logo of the event on people's cuts and, um, you know, certainly the, the activity across the uh, uh, Facebook and the internet seems to be a really, really bonding type of event which is uh which is great to see but rolling right back to the start of it um how did the idea of ride to the wall actually come about so the her majesty the queen opened the armed forces memorial on the 12th of october 2007 and i went up there to armistice day that year with about there was eight bites from the chapter went to the service and thought, yeah, this is quite moving and just pondered the idea. And in February 2008, at the directors meeting at Birmingham, I put the idea to all the other directors and kind of asked if 20 chapters could send potentially 10 bikes. Uh, so like 200 bikes to, to uh, try, try this service of remembrance. Uh, not knowing, not knowing what to expect at all. Uh, the car park, Tamworth services, and I'd laid Tamworth services out like, uh, like the Euro Tunnel. I had four lanes that I knew 50 bikes would go in each lane in the lorry park. Well, we had 1,800 bikes turn up. 
we had to send somebody out to the roundabout to stop people coming into the services because we'd just taken the whole thing over. I made the phone call to the CEO of the National Memorial Arboretum just as we were about to leave. And I said, Charles, uh, we're just about to leave now. It's not 200 bikes, it's 1800. See you soon. And put the phone down. So bless them, they had to manage 1800 bikes instead of 200, uh, doing something that they'd never done before. Uh, and as the saying goes, the rest is history. That actually was going to be my next question to you, Martin, but you seem to have answered that quite eloquently as to how the idea initially was perceived by people. I mean, 200 bikes becoming 1,800. It's, it's actually manifesting itself now, and I've been asked to sit on a working group about remembrance. Remembrance, Armistice Day is about the Great Wars, the First and Second World War. Well, there are very few people, there are no people left from there. So the youngsters, they, they can't relate. They've got nothing to relate to. What I call Ride to the Wall, it's live because if we lost somebody in conflict today, it actually has an immediate and dynamic impact on four generations. So they can remember where with the First and Second World War, there's no direct there's no direct link and people have moved on so hence why hence why ride to war is about post 1945 yeah i see on the uh, on your website that you know this is about remembering those that gave their lives since serving their it's serving their country since 1945 so am i right then in thinking that the, that the wall wouldn't have names from the previous wars as we would know it then the second world war and the first world war is that right no there it's just the 16 it's 16 just over sixteen thousand names on the war and when you think about it you know when you look at 500 not in afghanistan and things like that people start thinking where where do the sixteen thousand names come from but because it's because it's post 1945 there are still people alive that will remember not so much now we're getting quite kind of on the edge of it that will remember somebody just after 1945 whose name's on the wall. And it will it will never disappear because it, it will just be carried on by the families and things. And have you seen, you know, from, from the initial conception of the right to the wall to, to present day, you, you know, have you personally seen any changes in how... Um, how the event has the event changed in any way over the or you know since its initial conception? I'm one of these that if, if it's if it works, yeah, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. It's almost exactly the same, but what I have noticed is is the number of ex servicemen that are reconnecting with each other. I mean I have I've connected with sort of forty or fifty I served with in the late seventies, early eighties. And, you know, you can sit down, you can sit down and have a coffee with somebody that you haven't seen for 40 years. And it's like you haven't seen it for 10 minutes. It's a connection there. But the other thing which I never realized when I set it up was it's it's helpful. It's helpful for people that are struggling. Uh, and I'll, I will use the word PTSD. Uh, it's a safe environment right to wall where if they want to break down, they know that the people are, and most of the people around them have actually been there, uh, seen it, understand it, and they can do it comfortably. Yeah, I, I noticed, Martin, that the Right to the Wall received the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service in 2013. Um, how, how, how did that come about? Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, it, the Queen's Award is, is for volunteers, is the equivalent of MBE, I think, uh, for a group of volunteers. I was amazed that we've got it, we've got it just after five years. Uh, I look back on it now, and I was talking to somebody the other day about it. I thought, hold on, that was 10 years ago that we got that. And it was, it, I think it was somebody from the NMA who put us up for it, somebody who works with the volunteers at the NMA and appreciated the amount of volunteers we use that a lot of people don't see, the th over 300 volunteers that work on the day for Ride to the Wall. 
The um, I'm going to ask you a question here, but bef- before I do, I just want us to take a look at this. Right to the Wall is about remembering everyone who's been lost in service since the uh, Second World War. It started in 2008, and it's just grown because it touches people's hearts. It's a big family, big brotherhood. Being part of that brotherhood, that family of wallers, the ride itself is amazing. You, you, there's no other feeling than riding with 8,500 bikes, coming to one destination with one common goal, one common thought process. Um, uh, it's just an amazing day. Since the ride, I've come in between as well, just on our own and it's really different. It's quiet and peaceful like today. Or when you come on the ride, it's absolutely full of bikers. <laughs> it's amazing. The idea of adopting names was um, the biggest thing I hear from the families who have got names on the wall is um, their names being forgotten. It's very, very, very important to keep these names and memories alive of what these people did for us. Adopted a name off the wall for Staff Sergeant Sharon Elliott. I did a photo for Ralph, our standard bearer, uh, back in Ride to the Wall 2018. He asked me to get a picture of him um, as he was pointing to Sharon's name. And whilst I was uh, talking to um, Sharon's mother, um, we discussed the idea of actually adopting a name of which she was over the moon that somebody would want to uh, you know, take, take her name on and you know, remember her as who she was. I've adopted Royal Marine David Keyes. He was 19 years old and killed in action 14th of September, 1950. My journey started to find his family to ask their permission to adopt him. Several months later, around the country, it also took me to Australia and Bermuda. They were just blown away with about it. I'm starting to fill up a bit now, but that's, that's what I wanted to achieve, to be able to remember somebody that um, died for my freedom. But there's this thing about adopting names. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it was one of those things that came to me it was hours before I stood on, uh, you know, I think the day the day before Ride to War, and I can't remember how many years ago that was, because as I said at the start, we're coming into our 16th year now, which I find I've spent a quarter of my life doing Ride to the War, which is like, yeah, mind-blowing. Uh, obviously, a lot of people have got names on the wall that they... they they, it has an immediate impact on them and they, they, they were friends, they served with them and things like that. There were a lot of names on there that weren't weren't remembered for one reason or another. And I just suggested when I did my address one year, I just asked everybody if they would uh, consider adopting a couple of names on the wall, uh, getting in touch with the families and asking if it would be OK that they laid a cross or a wreath or something to remember them. And it just went from there. I mean, I had a message. I was in Belgium three weeks ago. With I took 56 bikes over there. And somebody had found a name on the wall. They'd got in touch with the family who now live in Belgium. And they're coming over to ride to wall this year. Parents that have lost a child... You know, it, I imagine that, and I and I can only imagine. I, I I don't have any personal experience, but the idea that their um, their son or daughter's name is forgotten or is no longer remembered or becomes, you know, part of a of a of a blank history, that must be a, a really really horrible thought. So to have um, to have someone approach them and say, "Listen, I'd like to adopt your child's name." Have you done it yourself? Yeah, I have done. Uh... There's a guy. There's a guy on the wall from 1959, which is the year I was born, and his name is M. Dickinson, and he was REF. I haven't done any more homework. I haven't done any more homework than that because I try and I want to try and remember them all. Uh, my family liaison officer 
who lost his son in 2007. Uh, he now, have you been to Rise of War, guys? No, to be honest with you, Martin, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, back into riding bikes in the last three, three and a half years. The last time I rode a bike before that was like 35 years ago. Um, and it, it's actually surprising to me because we had spoke to, uh, uh, you know, I, I personally had spoke to a few people that we had this interview coming up and they were going, well, what is Ride to the Wall? Right. Um, it, it's surprising how many people that don't know about it, you know, um, and not only do they not know about it, they don't know what it's about, what it's for. And from what I've read about it, Martin, to be honest with you, you know, it's a beautiful tribute, but it's also a lot more, you know, it, it seems to have grown a lot more. Um than remembrance. There are other concepts of it now as well, you know. I mean, I have read that, you know, throughout the years that it has donated a staggering amount of money um, as well as mobility scooters, etc., to the to the, uh, the NMA. Um, I mean, from your own from your own viewpoint, who was in this, who was involved in the initial conception of it, what, what would you say that the right to the wall of today has surpassed your expectation? Completely. So right to the wall, right to the wall was never about making money. Right to the wall was about remembrance and respect, remembering the names on the walls of the Armed Forces Memorial. 2008, at the end of it, we'd raised £10,000 and we couldn't really work out where that money had come from. And it was, well, let, let's... Uh, Let's expand on that. Uh, I think after about year five or six, I turned around and I said to my trustees and committee, I said, if we could raise £50,000 a year, that would be beyond my wildest dreams. That really would. Uh, we, uh, we, and we've, we've kept it pure. We've got no, I won't let anybody corporate come anywhere near it. Uh, I've, I've actually turned down a couple of awards, actually, because of that reason. Uh, but I think 2019 was our best year. We, we, we donated £159,000, uh, which is, to me, is a staggering, which is a staggering amount. I mean, the year we didn't have Ride to the Wall because of the COVID, and that was, we did the service, a two hour long service, and I rode in on my own, and we, we still raised £122,000. That's incredible. And this is obviously all donations from, from wallers, isn't it? This is, you know, these yeah. are people that have maybe served themselves or have, uh, have had family that served. Do you think it's the, do you think it's the military background of these individuals that produces this? It's almost like a loyalty, isn't it, or this camaraderie? Do you think that? Do you think something outside of the military environment would? Do you think it would gather this much traction? No, not at all. I mean, you know, if you think about Harley Davidsons and things like that after the Second World War and the glut of uh, WLA forty fives and things like that, uh, if you look at the MCs going back a long, long way. The structure of HOG is very reasonably similar to uh, military. And a lot of, lot of military guys were dispatch riders and things like that. I was in the Royal Corps of Transport, so we were transport. So that, that kind of, you know, it, it links in. It links in very well. And we, we do get a lot of... There are quite a few civilians turn up. I'll call them civilians, but they they will remember somebody. They might have a neighbour that was in the military or somebody they worked with and things like that. And I think right to all the remembrance is quite unique. I mentioned John Foster, my family liaison officer. What John does during the service or just before the service starts, and some people find this hard to believe, he takes up 25 families whose They've got children or uh, relatives whose name's on the wall. And they they walk up the steps to Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. 
Now you get some people that go, hold on a minute, this is a service of remembrance. How on earth, what, you know, that isn't, that's not the type of music you would think be played at service of remembrance. The thing with it is the mothers of the fallen actually call the steps of the AFM the stairway to heaven. And it works, it oh, works right. amazingly. Yeah. Yeah. It works amazingly because it's eight minutes, just over eight minutes long. And it just gives them time up there because they would want to stay up forever. But we need to get them back down and we need to do it in a way that... So, yeah, it's, uh, and they, the, the mothers, the mothers, the worst thing they say is losing a child. But the second thing is that name not being remembered. And I think that's that. Sorry, Jay. I think I think that's where the, this adopting the name idea. I think that is one of the most. That is such a beautiful sentiment. And has there been a big uptake on it? Do you know? I don't know. I say I know. Right to the walls, yours, but you won't. You won't have a, a, a grip of everything that's happening. The people's little ways. But has there been a big uptake of it? Yes. Yeah. You see an awful lot of people with waistcoats on, and you'll see two patches on the waistcoat, and it'll have their name. Mm-hmm. And where they, where they, what conflict they were killed in, and things like that. And there's quite a lot. In fact, I'm going to, I may be mentioning it again this year just to remind people because there'll be, there'll be some new wallers that won't have heard of it. Uh, but yeah, you'll, yeah. Uh, yeah, when you see the waistcoats, you'll see them on different people's, on, on their cuts, uh, the names they're remembering. And in, to, to use your terminology, can civvies, can civilians adopt a name or is it something that's reserved for the men and women that are served? Yeah, most definitely. Mo- most definitely. Once once they become warlers, they're part of a, and I don't know how it happened, it's a unique family. Uh, we're all mm-hmm. equal. Uh, nobody's got bigger cojones than the next person. Uh, and we're all there. Yeah. We're all there for the right reasons. I could, I occasionally get asked, why do we have it in October? Um, Personally, the reason it's in October is because it's the nearest date to when the the Majesty of the Queen dedicated the Armed Forces Memorial. Uh, But the other thing, I mean, weirdly, when it rains, I love it when it rains because you know everybody there is there for the right reason. You get a lovely sunny day and there are people that will go and it's just a ride out. They don't actually fully understand the impact and implications. Martin, on on that, right? I mean, earlier we spoke about the initial conception of the ride to the wall and whereas your expectations of it then were 200 bikes and it turned out to be 1,800 bikes. Where is that today in, in with regard to numbers? So what we've got at the moment is we've got just short of 4,700 people and three and a half thousand bikes registered. Uh, almost, almost identical to last year. We're running almost parallel to last year. Uh, last year, you know, the, you know, the elephant in the room is uh, utility bills, fuel prices. Everything's going up. Everything's going up. So, a little bit worried. What we had last year was we had it was the 15th anniversary, so we had some 15th anniversary merchandise. And then, bless her, when the Queen died, I did a, a remembrance patch and a remembrance pin, which helped with our uh, revenue coming in. Uh, which which means, yeah, the check presentation is on the 24th of June. Uh, it's one of the most closely guarded secrets in the world. Uh, but what I can say is that I'm extremely pleased in the climate that we're in, what will be presented on the day. I mean, with, with, with that amount of people registered and bikes registered for it, the organisation for an event of that size, it must be absolutely colossal, Martin. Is that yeah. – do you have a team that works along with you or – are yes, you running yeah, solo got, with uh, this? Or? Yeah, I've got a team of nine. Uh, that's the team of nine for Ride to Wall, but the external team. So in September of this year, 
we have a contact at the National Highways Agency that is telling us what roadworks will be in place on any of our routes next year. And even from then, so two years ago on the A38, we managed to get HS2 suspended for a week so it wouldn't impact on the riding. And that, you know, that blew me away. Uh, we have free passage on the day. Yeah, it's, it, it's like we had free passage, we have free passage on the day on the M6 toll. Uh, I've spoken to the NMA about one of the, we have police escorts, the, the police assist with most of the starting points. Uh, putting a rolling road on the M6 for Leicester, M1 for Leicester. One of the problems that we have is Staffordshire Police, because they haven't got a big biking section, but they've got Derby and Stoke. So if they're playing at home, that can we have problems getting support. So I've spoken to the NMA to actually approach the Football Association to see if they can change their fixtures for that day to away fixtures, which means their police can be released so it's all these little things behind the scenes that I don't think people realise. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The amount of organisation that that must go in, uh, you know, to create an, an event of that size. But for you know, for somebody like myself, Martin, um, who until recently had very little knowledge of the ride to the wall, um, and you know, if you were to tell them, you know, this is what it's about. This is the format of it. This is how you register for it. This is what to expect. What would you tell them? Well, just, I mean, we have a website, which is www.rttw.org. We kept it quite simple, you know, just put the four letters in. Remember those four letters? Uh, and the reason we ask people to register is that it helps us logistically with the 11 different start points around the country, because as they register, then they'll put where they're starting from. And it, Bar Drayton Manor, which is a restricted registration, uh, the rest of them are open. Uh, they meet up, they're, they're, there's marshals lead the ride in, there's marshals go up to each junction before to bring anybody down that's on the junction that hasn't gone to the start point for one reason or another. They arrive, I mean, I've, I've recently put on the Right to the Wall Facebook page an aerial photograph of the bikes being parked up. In a three-hour spell at Right to the Wall, my, my volunteers park up more bikes than they do at the MotoGP at Silverstone. And every single one of them, every single volunteer, every committee member, every trustee does it all uh, for nothing. Get no payment whatsoever. Uh once you arrive, once you arrive at the NMA, some people will go and look at memorials for particular reasons, uh, and then we've got we have the military wives singing. We'll have a military band. We hopefully, if the weather's clement, we have a fly past. The main service starts at quarter past two, uh, and I say to my committee, actually, right to war is about that minute silence, that one minute silence where you can remember the names on the wall. You can remember your own family that may have no military connections at all, but you know you're there. When you get 16,000 people, 16,000 motorcyclists and families stood for that minute and you can hear a pin drop, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty amazing experience. That must be powerful indeed, actually. Oh, it is. It's, I mean, when, when you talk about saying, when, when you said earlier on that, You've ne some people have never heard of it and things like that. I'm quite happy with that because we don't really, I would rather people come for the right reasons. It was in motorcycle news a few years ago and we had a low turn up and at the end of the minute silence, a load of people started clapping and I knew straight away there were people that didn't understand it and actually I don't really, if I'm getting between 12 and 16,000 people there, and raising between 120 and 150,000 pound a year. Actually, I'm more than happy with that. Uh, you you get many more than that, and it becomes unmanageable. 
I mean, even I mean, even just from a as you you were saying before uh, the the lo- simple logistics for the starting points, for example, when you've got that many motorcycles trying to join a motorway, for example, you know that that is that's a lot more than having a a, a guy up front and a tailor at the back, as we would be used to on on chapter rides. You know, you'd have your your, your tail gunner at the back, you'd have the guy leading the ride. The you know the the police involvement I presume with the numbers you have now is absolutely mandatory. I mean to try and do it without some sort of police escort could almost be dangerous. Yeah, it's one of those. Over the years, the police have been absolutely amazing. They really have, and I always say, you know, they've done it for that many years. There's no reason for them to stop doing it. Uh, Leicester police pull out and block mm-hmm. the motorway for about fifteen minutes, but everybody everybody's warned in advance uh we're not out to cause trouble but to be perfectly honest it's quite negative that is because you know what the media is like and the tabloids and things like that they love they love drama and people will say to me mark we we get no national coverage we get local coverage we, we get no national coverage uh if we got national coverage there'd be more people want to attend would they be the right people attending I don't know, but because we go there respectful, no trouble, we're not giving motorcyclists a bad name, I believe we should be recognised for that, um, but it isn't, it's not a story that the media want. You can leave uh, when everything clears up at the end of the day and you're leaving, there's been 16,000 motorcyclists there, you could put the rubbish in a carrier bag. Not a bin bag. You could put the rubbish in a carrier bag that's been dropped and things like that, uh, which says a lot. Which says, a, but it isn't. It's not the image that the public want. The, the image they want of motorcyclists is people tearing around, racing around, causing trouble and things like that, which we don't do. Yeah, that that's, that that can be. That's that is that's a general conception, Martin. Which is why we did the month long uh episode well they did four or five different episodes of uh you know of of, of women who who ride harleys yeah. um and try to dispel that uh image that people have in their head that this is what uh bikers and as you quite rightly said so at the beginning you know there are bikers and there are motorcyclists but yeah, but for for anybody that is that is thinking about attending the ride to the wall this year for the first time, um, are there any tips that you could give them either for their journey time, arrival, their time at the NMA, or or any other aspect? Really, any anything that you could t- uh, advise them? Yeah, what I would say is our preference would be join on the start points. If you don't join on the start points, get there as early as possible. Just to experience the day, uh, you'll see motorcycles coming in from as early as nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, just make sure that you're appropriately dressed. Uh, m- most people are, uh, but be, be open and in- enjoy the. I'm not going to say enjoy the experience, but uh, it's it's memorable. Yeah, yeah. It's after sixteen years. It kind of well, it's my life now. It's what I do, uh, literally for two or three hours a day. You don't become blasé about it. I mean, I, I can sit here and I can write my address for this year's, uh, for this year's event, and I can read it over and over again. I stand up on the lectern, and invariably I get about three words out, and that's it. I've got to pause and take a breath because when you're standing there and you're looking out of a, at a venue that is normally green, that has turned black, and you know those people, and I kind of, I don't get this bit, these people that are hanging on my every word when I've got stood behind me a one-star, a two-star, and a three-star general. Uh, Lamont Kirkland, who was my... Uh, my initial patron, uh, and then uh, Paul Jakes, who's a three-star, but they're all retired now. He's a three-star general. 
uh, who have asked to become patrons of Right to War, which is a massive honour, really is to me. Uh, and you can imagine to the military guys uh, that, are, that attend, to have a three-star general there addressing them is something, or just talking to them, just talking to them, to them normally, just because uh, they are just normal guys, really are. You said there that you you don't get this bit about people hanging on every word you say. Um, I suppose from their point of view, they're listening to the guy that, very simply, it wouldn't have been happening if it hadn't have been for you. And no doubt that people get in touch with you throughout the year, you know, maybe wanting you to mention this or talk about that. And, you know, do you, do you, do you get much of that? Do you people, you know, trying to say, would you, you know, would you mention this person or do you not mention individuals and then try to deal with it as a collective? Cause that must be quite a tight rope to walk. Yeah, no, I don't, don't mention individuals because the, my belief is the problem with that, you mention an individual, then when you forget one, it becomes a problem. Uh, it's like funerals. Uh, I'm, a, I'm at a funeral actually next Wednesday up in Hartlepool, but purely and simply, he was, we lost him on the trip we did three weeks ago in Belgium. Uh, but he was a waller and he used to, he was one of the volunteers, volunteers at Drayton Manor. But we, uh, I flew, I flew the standard at a funeral many, many years ago uh, for a guy called Wilf Taylor. And Wilf was 83 when he died. He was a waller, but he was the only waller that actually served our king. He had a king's cap badge in, and I thought, you know what, that's pretty special. Uh, the standard doesn't get flown yeah. at any other waller's funeral because the reason for that is that mm -hmm. I've got a guy who carries the standard. To be sending him all over the country would ultimately put, ultimately incur costs, which we don't do. So yeah. it, it's no longer, it won't be going up next Wednesday. Uh, we don't have the standard. I don't, when we do the Waller magazine every three months, if I'm made aware of any fallen Wallers, there'll be a picture of them and the date of birth and the date of death. Uh, and that's it. But as soon as you start, I've been asked, I've been asked for this year if there's a possibility of wreaths from each cap badge can be laid at the Basra wall because of Octelic. And I said, actually, no, you can do that privately, logistically, when you're trying to get through 16,000 people. It's a static service on the steps of the Armed Forces Memorial. Those names on the Basra wall are actually on the Armed Forces Memorial wall. If before or after the service you want to do your thing. He came back and said, fine. Uh, I've had people from the Merchant Navy uh, asking if they can be mentioned. And I said, we, I can't mention individuals. I always talk about the names on the wall of the Armed Forces Memorial. So it encompasses everybody that's on there. To do otherwise, as you say, I mean, it, it's a, a, a real tightrope. And then, you know, I mean, just if I can boil it down to just simple administration to try and do something at such an individual level. I mean, the administration there would be would be difficult, and the, the, I think the fear would be that someone would be missed or left out when that really is not the aim. No, I've I've been approached twice now by a massive corporate company. I'm not going to say the name of it, but uh, I've been I've been approached twice. I've also been approached by other companies wanting to get involved in right of the wall. And I've said, no, if you read our mission statement and core values, it's not a platform for third parties to promote themselves. Yes. And you make that very, very clear, actually. I'm surprised they've, I'm surprised they've even approached. Yeah. I, I had a charity approach me three years ago and asked for a third of the money that I was going to present to the NMA because they wanted a memorial at the NMA. And they said the reason they want a third of the money is because they attend right to war. I said, so what you want me to do is I'll stand up when we do the check presentation and say, well, it's a third down because I've given it to X for their memorial. And he said, well, so you're not going to support that? I said, no, not at all. Uh, similar many years ago, I was, uh, I got off, off a Pride of Britain award and I turned it down because of the, corporate sponsorship by a national newspaper 
There was also a article in Motorcycle News about mo uh, biking heroes, and it was a it was a, a page in Motorcycle News. The final ten, the ten finalists, half a page was me, and the other nine were on the bottom section. And I looked at it. I found out that the sponsors were uh, a a motor. I nearly said a mo a uh, insurance company. And I said, so what's going to happen then if I win? You're going to want photographs of me in front of your billboards promoting your company. I said, I'm sorry because I'll get people saying, Ah, what was in it for you then? What did you get out of this? And I said, I mean, 16 years. In 16 years, we have never come across anybody's radar uh, of of any any wrongdoing or anything like that. That's a great attitude, Martin. It really is, and it's and, it, and it's commendable. It really is. You're due to present the check to the NMA on the 24th of June. Now, we're not going to ask you what the amount is going to be, right? But are you pleased with the with the uh, support from the Wallers last year? Very much so. Uh, in the, as I said earlier, the climate we're in, uh, the check we're presenting. I'm yeah, I'm I'm over the moon. Every year, every year we've gone like that. And in 2019, when we got to 159,000 pound, it was like, for me personally, if the following year we'd presented 140, I would have, I would have taken that personally, which I shouldn't do. As it was, we had COVID, which dropped it to 122, but yeah. that wasn't my fault. So do you know what? I'm happy with that. Uh, let's we let went, you off the hook then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we went, so we dropped to 122. Last year we did 135. And this year we're doing, yeah, the check's written. Uh, I know the check's been written on a big, big board. Uh, I've got people lined up. So I've got one of my uh, Pay, two, of my, two of my three patrons are coming along, which I'm over the moon with because obviously they have commitments and, and things like that. One of them works for the cabinet office now. Uh, but we're uh, we're not one of these charities that are in your face, that shout from the rooftops. I think we just do it, and I don't know if it's my character, I think we just do it nice and gently uh, and just welcome welcome everybody. I think that's been working for you, though, hasn't it? it that, that's been working for you because, as you say, I mean, you could maybe double that crowd, but would it be, would it be the right crowd? You know, and I think from what we've discussed here today, you, 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 the people that are there are there for the right reasons every time. We have no, we have no VIPs and celebrities. Uh, the the event manager at the NMA many years ago when he took over, I had a meeting with him and he had an agenda. And on the agenda, it said VIP. And I just smiled. And when we got to it, he said, Martin, he said, do you have VIPs at Rides of the Wall? I said, yes. Yeah, about 16,000 of them. Yeah. Exactly. They are the important people. I mean, I did get a bit of a buzz. I don't know if you've watched the video from 2020. If you watch... Uh, if you watch the Brothers in Arms thing, and Mark Knopfler does a personal message at the end of that, I mean that was a that was a buzz. Mark was going to ride last year, but he has a he has a back problem, and he was only going to ride on the condition that he was riding as a motorcyclist and nothing else at all. And I actually said, I said, well, don't think it's going to be anything other than that. You, if you want to attend, it's going to be attending as just a motorcyclist. I said it would be quite a buzz when when you walk in, when you get off your bike and you're walking around. You can imagine people looking and thinking, "Hold on." So tell tell me this, Martin. Right, um, just to get this information out there, if you're not if you're not planning to attend the ride to the wall this year, can you still donate? Yes, you can. If you go onto the uh, if you go onto the website. And there's a, there's a there's a section to do donations, and just make a donation, which will be very much appreciated. Well, as 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 usual, um, after the show here, when you know when we uh, upload this onto the Hogpod website, we will put the links, um, both to what the Ride to the Wall is about, 
and also a donation link uh, on uh, underneath that, right? And just give them a bit of a, you know a bit of further information on it. Um, just to move away now for a second or two from the ride to the wall, Martin, and yourself on a personal level now. What are your personal plans for the riding season of 2023? Uh, I can't ride for at least another six weeks uh, because I've had uh, shoulder surgery. Uh, hopefully going along to uh, Fields of Thunder, uh, going up to Heart and Soul, and then I've got Rock. Uh, I mean, being, being in Hog since 2002, you know, back in the day... I did three European rallies a year. Uh, I rode, rode back from Facacy in one hit in 12 hours back in 2009. So I've done, I've done a lot of rallies. The chapter, we European chapter, we won the European chapter challenge for three times and we were sofa winners five times. So I've kind of, I've done quite a lot and now I'm, uh, I won't say slowing up, but, you know, priorities are slightly different now. Uh, I mean, 2000, I, was, I sat writing, writing stuff down here. In uh, 2006, I competed in the world's strongest bike route in Las Vegas. Uh, and then I don't know if you heard of a guy called Indian Larry, bike builder. No, Indian Larry was massive in America. I was with him five weeks before he died, and then I've been over to the States a couple of times to a couple of block parties, memorial parties of his. So I'm kind of I'm kind of that hotel kind of guy at rallies now. But I like doing Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like doing the uh, things a little bit different. I mean, I've been invited over to. Holidays for Heroes Rally in Jersey next year. Uh, I'm doing Conrad's ride in July. Conrad was the 353rd guy to die in Afghanistan. I know he's, I served with his dad and things like that. So, right. I mean, rallies, I like to see a USP with, with you know, something that will give me a buzz. Friday, you know, turn up on a Friday, yeah. get hammered on a Friday night, can't really ride on Saturday because you had too much to drink. Saturday night you don't drink much because you've had too much on the Friday, and then you get on the bike and ride home Sunday. Uh, that's how it used to be. Uh, but it's, you know, what I'm looking forward to, the heart and soul and things like that, and feel to thunder if I get there, is just networking. Networking with people which will progress to heart and soul, which more which the progression will be greater for rock, hopefully. I was just going to touch on that, Martin. You know, you know, uh, a few minutes ago you said that you're sort of at that stage now where you're slowing up, um, and I'm sort of sitting thinking, so hold on a minute here, right? You know, he's moved from Neen Valley to regional officer, one of the, one of the hog regional regional officers for UK and Ireland. Um, taking on the right to the wall and you know to me that's not slowing up I mean your role with as a regional officer for HOG must in itself be challenging yeah it is it's uh, obviously so 12 of my 14 years as a director I was a I was an orphan chapter I didn't have a dealership so Amy's asked me to help help manage and where I can help the five orphan chapters in the UK. So, nah, so this morning, quarter to six this morning, sat out in the sun typing emails. That isn't really work, is it? I'm, I'm there to give advice if I can. Uh, at the moment, one of the things that I've spoken to the orphan chapters about is creating their own bylaws and handbook uh, because the chapter charter is 13 pages and actually it, doesn't really tell you much. So we've had bylaws uh, with Neen Valley for a long, long time and actually nailed them down, even down to code of conduct and things like that and how to ride. And, and I've, as I've said to the orphan chap, uh, orphan chapters, I think, are in a brilliant position because they can run their chapter. They haven't got they haven't got a dealer 
Uh, and actually, I mean, in the real world, as I said right at the start, or as I said before we came on air, dealers have got a business to run. Uh, and, and as you know, some chapter members, they want, they want gold. They want it all. And that, I mean, I was speaking to a dealer principal last year. His coffee machine bill is £600 a month. You know, when you go into a dealership and you get a free cup of coffee, his bill is £600 a month for that machine. Well, actually, you've got to sell, you've got to sell a few bikes to get that money back. Well, it's, this is it. They're expensive machines, but there's not the there's not no, the margin no. that people and think. things, you know, like the bunting and stuff like that uh, for rallies. It it all costs money. It all costs money, and every everywhere people people are looking to try and save money. Uh, people and, and and that goes to us as individuals. You're looking to pull the purse strings in. Well, if you're looking to do that, and you know, that's potentially a reflection when you said, Gerard, about heart and soul, potentially going to every, maybe maybe going to every two years. They may have acknowledged that actually yeah, yeah. people can't do it every year. Uh, they, you know, they yeah, need to do yeah. family things. We'd all love to do, we'd all love yeah. to do Killarney, go to hung, uh, Hungary, Budapest and go to Fakasi. Well, actually, when I was working, I used to. But the average, I did a thing last year, the average age of hot members in chapters, how old do you think it is? Uh, chap- so <laughs> if I can remember rightly, because we did speak yeah. about this in Birmingham, was it 62? Right. Oh, the average Hallie Valley 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 was 50 is something 62, or the other way around? But the average age of chapter members throughout the UK is 58 years old. Mm-hmm. So potentially quite a few of them are okay. getting yeah. towards retirement. They're getting towards Go retirement. Go away, that beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go away, that beer, Martin. I'm nowhere near it. Well, yeah, well, I retired in 2014. But so you're getting near, they're getting near retirement where that dispo, the disposable income is then reduced because of retirement and things like that. Yeah. So they've really got to, you know, as I say, back in 2003, doing the 100th anniversary in Barcelona and coming back from that and doing the other European tour, you could do that. But now you've actually got to sit down and go, right, this year we'll do this and we'll do that. And then next year we'll do something else. Yeah, I'm... Well, I think with a, it's, it's only right, Jared, that we give a shout out here. So anyone that would ordinarily go to the Heart and Soul, uh, they that rally does conflict with one of the greatest ones in the UK, which is the the Belfast one, which is ours. So um, everyone that is in the uh, Geordie chapter or goes to the Heart and Soul rally, you you are formally invited to come and join us over in Northern Ireland in 2024. Uh, to Good plan. Well a, said. Can I couldn't have said that better myself. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Okay, so um, for anyone that is um, that would like to donate to uh, to this superb uh, cause, uh, the upkeep of the uh, the NMA, um, the uh, there is a text. I'll stick it down below. Is here. If you just text R T T W O eight followed by five pounds to seven zero zero seven zero. Uh, that will uh, be a donation. If you can't make it this year or geographically, it's against you, but you still like to do your bit. Um, last question for me, Martin, before we wrap it up. Um, I, I'm following the Rides of the Wall Facebook uh, uh, group, and there is every single day more and more people opening their packages, and they're so delighted with all of their, you know, their bar and their T-shirts. You must have some warehouse of staff doing that for you. I thought that so, was the case. So, Pat, so there's there's Pat's chair there. This is this is the ride to the wall office. So, Pat will process all the orders in here. I then walk into the garage and pick and pack them. One of the benefits I had this year is because obviously with my shoulder surgery, I had a full four week break where I couldn't do any. So, Pat, bless her, had to do them all. But so far this year, we have picked and packed just short. So I've taken to the post office just short of 4,000 
packages between the two of us. And people, I mean, I joke with people. I joke with people and they, you know, I call it the Amazon warehouse. It's half of a double garage. And the benefit of that is that if that half of the garage was free, I'd more likely be building another bike. So I'm actually saving money. Would you have, Martin, again, for anyone who can't attend um, the Ride to the Wall, would you have like an online store that people can go and purchase these? Yes, if you go onto the website, there's a merchandise store there with many, many items. I mean, one thing I am quite proud of, we uh, we used to do a paracord bracelet. And uh, the company I was dealing with, for some reason, I just I didn't get on with them. And I knew they got them from China. And I actually found uh, found a company in China that did a paracord bracelet for far less than they were charging me. And I got in touch with them, set up an account with this Chinese company for a sample. And actually this morning I got the email showing me the sample, which is far superior to the one uh, to the one we've had before. And once I see the sample, we'll, I'll, I'll be dealing direct with China, which was something a few years ago I would never have thought uh, happened. Thanks so much for taking the time to to join us today from the Rides to the Wall HQ as well, as it turns out, and obviously sharing the story. Um, we uh, we wish you the very best of luck with the check presentation, uh, and also as uh, I think you, the message you're trying to get out there as well. And uh, I'll just repeat it: a huge thank you to the uh, to every single Waller, because very simply, you are the VIPs. If it wasn't for you, the event would be non-existent. Um, it's a it's a huge family and clearly one that everyone feels a great privilege to be part of. And at some stage, Martin, I haven't done it to date, but I will be looking to come across myself. There's a, it'd, be, it'd definitely be something I want to experience uh, with, with my own eyes. If it hadn't been for chapters that supply the marshalling, we wouldn't have had the 11 different start points around the country. They're all marshaled by hog chapters, or most of them are marshaled by hog chapters. So they all they all work very, very similar to each other. But without these 300 volunteers that do the marshalling and the parking up, a lot of them are Harley Davidson riders, we, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. So big shout out to those guys too. Just to reiterate what, what Kenny has just said, Martin, thanks for coming on board and and telling us about the ride to the wall and what it's about and what to expect. And well done to you and your team for such sterling work. And for anybody that's watching this episode, check out the links below. There will be links below that will take you directly to the website and to the donation site. If you can't make the ride to the wall, then please donate to it. And uh, thanks very much, guys, for inviting me. And hopefully this will uh, spread the word a little bit more.